afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your time. Um, I thought I might just make a few opening comments and then just open it up to uh, any questions that you have. And might I say, if there's any um, follow-up issues, uh, happy to discuss them with you at some future time or take questions in writing. Uh, and, and at the outset, uh, let me add to that last remark by saying that this area of police pursuits has always uh, and continues to be one of the most challenging for police in terms of their overall role for the responsibility for public safety. But the difficulty associated with the decision and uh, decision making and judgment that's involved, and I thought yesterday's events were probably a really good example of the degree of difficulty uh, associated with that judgment that's required. And, and I do think that yesterday, uh, uh, the police officers involved uh, demonstrated very good judgment uh, in decision making and professionalism in the way they handled that matter. And also, obviously, I'd like to thank the media. Uh, for their uh, support and assistance yesterday in terms of the uh, coverage from the uh, helicopters. Um, if I could just talk more broadly for a moment, over time, and particularly over the last um, 12 years or so, our police pursuit policy in Queensland has become more and more restrictive. Uh, around 12 years ago, uh, our policy was very open-ended and the reality was that our policy enabled and allowed police to, to pursue uh, a motorist for almost any offence uh, and without any conditions. So in effect, uh, the police, if they went to stop someone who was driving an unregistered vehicle and that person failed to stop and accelerated away and fled from the police, uh, we could, under our policy that existed then over a decade ago, chase that unregistered vehicle for any distance, at any speed, uh, under any circumstances. Um, and most people, I think, would say that that wasn't appropriate, that the seriousness of that offence did not warrant a police pursuit. And over time, uh, our policy has become more and more restrictive. Following a series of coronial inquests in 2010 and 13 recommendations from the coroner, which were accepted by the then uh, government, uh, our policy changed again and became uh, even more restrictive. And throughout 2011, we retrained all police in that new policy, and that new policy came into effect uh, in December last year. Uh, I think the current policy is as restrictive as it possibly can be. Uh, we still need uh, the ability for police to make situational judgments depending on the circumstances. So in my view, I wouldn't want to see the current policy become more restrictive. Um, I think there would probably be difficulty at this time in relaxing the policy and making it less restrictive. And the reason I say that is because we've just gone through a situation where we've trained nearly uh, you know, 11,000 police in the new policy, the more restrictive policy. It only came into effect in December. So um, whilst it's not impossible, uh, it would, in my view, um, be very difficult and it's not the time to relax the policy. What we have to do is make the current policy work what we're seeing, I believe, too, is a new phenomenon. Generally, people who don't stop for the police and who evade the police and will um, possibly engage in a police pursuit do so because they want to get away. Now, that can be for as simple uh, as driving an unregistered vehicle, uh, as simple as uh, perhaps someone having been worried that they might be over the limit, they've had a few drinks and might be over the limit. Uh, it could be that they're an unlicensed driver. Uh, at the more extreme end, it could be that they're an active criminal and they're driving a stolen car. Uh, but generally what they're trying to do is get away. And our policy reflects that. Um, and it's my view, and I think it would be the view of most people, that it wouldn't matter how valuable a car is, a stolen car is, it could be a Ferrari or a Rolls Royce, it's not worth the life uh, of a person who is quite innocent in the proceedings. So if we chase a stolen car, um, for a long distance and that stolen car goes through a red light at high speed and collides with a family innocently travelling through the green light at that same intersection um, and, and someone's killed, then no matter what the value of that stolen car, it's not worth that loss of life or potentially uh, terrible injuries to innocent people. And that is why we have a policy where we say that in most cases we will abandon the pursuit because the risk to the public is not worth the benefits in continuing to chase them and catch them. What 
I believe we're seeing, though, is a new phenomena today, and we're seeing a phenomena where we have people who are stealing cars, and generally these are young men, very young men, who are high risk takers, who are stealing cars and engaging in pursuits deliberately and intentionally with the police, uh, encouraging and actively wanting that pursuit to happen. And that's something that's very difficult for us to deal with. Uh, I can't comment on the matter yesterday because that's before the courts. But this is something new for us, uh, and it's something that we're obviously going to have to deal with. And each occasion that that occurs, uh, we'll have to make judgment calls, and the police officers involved in it will have to make a judgment call as to whether it's better to abandon the pursuit or in the overall interest of public safety, given the behaviour of the people involved, to continue it. So these are really quite complex issues. Uh, always has been, in my view, one of the most challenging issues for police officers in terms of the work that they do. Um, but, um, you know, this is um, an example. I, sorry, again, I thought the situation yesterday, though, quite frankly, was an example of very good uh, judgment, good professional policing. And at the end of the day, um, we got the result that I guess everyone wanted, that um, the alleged offenders were detained, the vehicles were recovered, but most importantly, most importantly, no one was hurt. I do have one appeal which we are very grateful to the media for, um, uh, well, for promoting for us, and we ask for your continued support in this. Uh, again, regrettably, as situations change over the time, sometimes criminal behaviour changes uh, to adapt to that. We've seen a massive reduction in car theft in Queensland in the last decade. Car theft is uh, better than halved. Ten years ago, around 20,000 cars were being stolen in Queensland each year. Uh, last year, it was under 10,000, so that's a great result. One of the contributing factors to that, apart from some good police work and effort, though, has been that cars are now much harder to steal than they ever were. Uh, many, many years ago, it was ridiculously easy uh, to steal a vehicle. Um, now it's very, very difficult to steal a modern vehicle that's produced in 2012. What we're seeing now, though, is that people who want to steal the cars uh, will break into someone's home and take the keys to achieve that purpose. So what we're asking, and this will require a dramatic change for me personally uh, and for everyone, uh, to consider and, and do this for us, if you would, consider hiding the vehicle keys in your own home. I know that's a terrible thing to have to ask, uh, but it's something that regrettably is a reality. And the vehicles that were stolen yesterday um, uh, were both stolen because people broke into the home of the owner and stole the keys. So that's probably all I need to say at the moment. Happy to take any questions now or into the future. Is your view that uh, now is not the time to relax the police pursuits policy puts you at odds with your new minister? Are you comfortable with that? Oh, not at all. No, no. The minister is simply... The minister is indeed a new minister. Uh, he's recognised this, in my view, as one of the most difficult and important areas facing policing. And what he says he wants to do and intends to do, which I support, is to review the policy. Um, my position, though, is that I think it would be very difficult at the current time to change the policy because you can't change the policy every five minutes. Uh, it's we, not we, just a political review. You would be involved in that review. I'm sorry. It's not just a political review of it, him saying he doesn't like the policy. It's something that you would be involved no, in. No, I'm, right? I'm looking forward to sitting down with the Minister and, in fact, we're preparing a briefing note for the Minister at the moment. But I didn't think, in fairness to the Minister, that he had said... Uh, that there's any intent to change the policy. What he said he wants to do is review it, which is very different from change. And I, as I understood it, he wants to be aware of all of the issues involved. And there are many issues involved here. Um, there are the issues um, of technology and how that might be used. Uh, there are the issues of prevention, how we might prevent these things happening in the first place. And sadly, as I've just asked you, one of the ways we might be able to prevent this is if we're able to hide our own car keys in our own homes and not leave them on the kitchen bench, you know, and which is what many people do. And there's no criticism of that. That's something that you should be able to do. It's quite... I feel really uncomfortable asking you to support us in asking the public to hide your car keys in your own home. I think that's a very sad thing to have to ask, but regrettably we do have to ask the public to do that and we hope that they uh, do, do follow that, um, that suggestion. But, but there's issues, if I could just add, um, of prevention, so prevention by you know, trying to limit the ability of people to steal cars. Uh, and, and as well, there's the need for us in the police uh, where we do abandon a pursuit to follow up relentlessly on that, try to get the offenders. And there's, there's the issue of deterrence. And I mentioned this morning that I'm... And I'm not politically aligned in any way, but I'm genuinely grateful to the uh, incoming and new government 
for having a policy, um, which I understand they intend to enact through legislation, where there will be a minimum penalty for evading the police of a $5,000 fine and two years disqualification on, my driver's on a person's driver's licence. Uh, and I am grateful for that because one of the things I've um, raised on a number of occasions is that there needs to be uh, a deterrent effect for people who um, de decide not to stop for the police. Yesterday there were some problems with communication. Um, when the helicopters were in the air, when they were in the Ipswich Police District, uh, it was very easy to, to talk on the radio to the police communication centre and give police up to minute instructions on where the vehicle was. When they went to Brisbane, because of the difference in uh, radio technology, you should be aware of digital encryption, that couldn't be done. And in the end, the police heli uh, the helicopter actually had to ring triple zero. How will you deal with that? Is, it, is that something that should be looked at? Should there be an analogue channel for emergency use that applies across the state? Look, I intend to follow up on that, and certainly it's uh, something that I was aware of um, and was raised uh, by the media. Uh, we need to look at uh, how we can address that. I can't give you the precise answer now. The analogue channel through the Police Communication Centre here is one, one avenue. Uh, we only have digital secure, secure communications here in Brisbane. We don't have it anywhere else in the state. Um, I, I'm, I understand as well that the people in the police communications centre were actually watching television and were able to monitor it in that sense as well. But it's something we can work with the media on, uh, and I'm sure there's a solution to it. As the digital rollout becomes um, you know, mm. around the state in the coming years, will that become more important, do you think? Uh, Look, I, I, I think it's manageable. I'm sure that there's a way through this. Uh, and um, fortunately, these events, of course, don't happen that often. Um, but certainly, uh, we are grateful always for the support of the media, and it's not always in situations like we saw yesterday. Um, yeah, and it's, it's actually, it's interesting as a side issue, if I might share it with you, that um, uh, one of the uh, aspects uh, that needs to be considered is this too, is that if people know that they're being observed through uh, aerial observation, um, it's often the case, can I just go back one, if someone um, simply wants to get away from the police, once we abandon the pursuit, the research tends to show that unless it's their own car and they're going home, they'll abandon the vehicle fairly quickly. Clearly that didn't happen yesterday. Uh, and where there's an aerial pursuit involved, generally the tendency will be to go to an underground car park to get out of sight of the uh, aerial observation platform, in this case helicopters. Um, have, were there any other communications issues yesterday? We were contacted by one officer who was involved in the, in the pursuit that said going between the different regions and different communication centres, there were some communication problems between the marked and unmarked cars and that sort of thing. Are you aware of any others? Uh, n no, I think you've summed that up pretty completely. Uh, there's the one you mentioned initially in terms of the analogue versus digital systems. Uh, and, and that's a challenge, obviously, for us because police vehicles will work on different radio channels and detectives might well work on a different channel to a traffic French car, to a general duties uniform vehicle. So um, uh, that's obviously, um, in terms of communication, that can be a challenge, yes. especially when something's happening very quickly. Such a wide um, area. Well, that becomes a problem, is that? Yeah, but it's not insurmountable. Um, and that's the role of police communication centres to provide for that coordination. I mean, I, I thought overall yesterday um, was um, a, a pretty good effort. I really did. Uh, and I thought it was well managed, um, um, well conducted by the operational police on the job. And I thought their judgment, um, you know, and their decision making was, um, was uh, very professional. The police helicopter, is that not able to be used outside the Gold Coast region? Well, well uh, I'm sure it could be in a critical emergency, but the arrangement um, was with the Gold Coast City Council, uh, and they are funding primarily the operation of the helicopter, and in fairness to the Gold Coast City Council, the arrangement that we entered into with them was that the helicopter would be used in that area, and I think that's fair enough. Um, uh, I don't think there was any need for the Gold Coast-based helicopter be, to be used yesterday because it could have done no more than add to what the media t helicopters were already doing. So I don't think there was any loss there in terms of the helicopter not being available. Uh, I feel fairly sure that um, the Gold Coast City Council um, would have agreed to the emergency use of the helicopter if that had been required. The current arrangements with the Gold Coast City Council expire in about four or five weeks' time. 
Uh, and what we're endeavouring to do, obviously, is to continue those, and that is, in fact, a government commitment, of course, to continue those arrangements. And my understanding of the government commitment with helicopters is that in approximately two years' time, the government will provide two helicopters, uh, one for the Gold Coast uh, area and continue that, that service, uh, and the other for the rest of South East Queensland. Um, the families of some of the alleged offenders yesterday have made a series of wide-ranging allegations outside court, one of them being that some of these uh, young teenagers were assaulted in the watch house. Is there any credence to this at all? I have no knowledge of that whatsoever, and I was only told about that a few minutes ago before I came into this press conference. Uh, look, I'll refer that to the CMC, uh, and uh, if uh, anyone has a complaint to make against the police, they can make that uh, here at headquarters. Uh, they can make that at a local police station or they can go directly to the CMC uh, themselves. Uh, but um, I have no knowledge of that, ha of course, ha of that having occurred. We've seen comments online from some of the friends and family of these alleged offenders saying that they can get away from police because they know that they won't be chased. Mm. How do you answer that criticism? Yeah. Particularly knowing it, it went on for a very long time yesterday and some people say far too long and police should have stepped in. Yeah. You know, it... it what I think it does is reflect the degree of difficulty associated with this issue. And, and I believe, as I said at the outset, um, that I think this is one of the most challenging and difficult areas of policing. Policing is not an easy job, it's a difficult job at any time, whether you're dealing with domestic violence, alcohol-related violence, um, the unfortunate situation of someone you know, uh, having their home broken into. Uh, their child uh, using drugs. I mean, any of the circumstances and issues they deal with are difficult, but this is right up there with the very, the most difficult of all. Um, and every situation has got to be judged on its own merits. Uh, I think the judgment calls that the officers made yesterday in terms of continuing that matter on, despite the length of time it went for, but at times, quite often backing off, uh, I think their judgment calls were good. And I think the situation yesterday was one that justified and warranted the continuation of the effort uh, to ultimately get to the result that was achieved. Um, generally speaking, though, if a vehicle is stolen, we may well abandon the pursuit um, because it may be that it's in the overall safety interests of everyone that it's better to stop chasing the person in the stolen vehicle and let it go uh, in the hope that they uh, very soon after stop their dangerous driving and abandon the vehicle. The message the children are interpreting from that is police aren't going to chase me. Yeah. So I can get away with it. Yes. Does and that, that concern you? It does. Uh, but that was always going to be the risk with a more restrictive policy. When I gave evidence at the coronial inquiries in 2010, and I'm not being critical of anyone here, this is not a perfect world. Um, and uh, there are many, many aspects to this. And one of the aspects to it is that we have in Queensland, as they do anywhere, a small percentage of totally irresponsible people um, who uh, will be aware of our policy and may use that uh, to what they see as their advantage. But we have to weigh it all up. And at the end of the day, uh, I just would like to repeat what I said earlier, that there's no stolen car uh, that is worth the life of an innocent Queenslander. There is no stolen car that's worth the life of an innocent Queenslander. And if that means that we have to abandon the pursuit of a stolen car in the interest of overall safety, then that's what we need to do. Um, and if you're driving at night through an intersection uh, and you see a... Sorry, if you're approaching an intersection at night time in, say, an 80 kilometre an hour zone and you see a green light, you're entitled to think that you can drive through that intersection in safety. And what you don't want is someone coming through the red at high speed and hitting you, you know? Uh, and the more we can minimise that sort of risk, the better. But regrettably, uh, as I mentioned earlier, most people who engage in a police pursuit, who don't stop for the police, you know, all they want to do is get away. All they want to do is get away. But there's a small percentage of totally irresponsible people who are different to that. And in the worst cases of it, they actively try to engage the police in a pursuit. And that's where my people have to make really critical judgment calls. To add to that, most of the people who do that are male, they're young, they're likely quite possibly to be alcohol or drug affected. In the worst and most dangerous of cases, um, they're at risk of self-harm. In other words, they're potentially suicidal. They have no regard for themselves or anyone else. 
and they're behind the wheel of a car. And so these are very difficult issues. The helicopter on the Gold Coast, um, does it have both digital and analog radios in it? Like, can it talk to both sets of communications areas that you know? Look, I don't. Uh, certainly it's got analogue. I don't know if it has digital. We don't have digital on the Gold Coast. Can I follow uh, up on that and come back to you with the precise answer on that? Commissioner, so can you just clarify, is it your personal belief that the current pursuit policy is too restrictive? Even though you don't necessarily think changes should be made, do you believe that it is too restrictive? Um, my, my points are that um, obviously this is not something that's stationary. This will continue to evolve. I'll, I'll, I will answer your question, but I just wanted to make the point that this will continue to evolve. I'm really hopeful that over time, and it won't happen today or tomorrow, that with technology we can do a, a lot in this area. I'm hopeful that with stolen vehicles we will have things like remote engine disablers and GPS tracking so that if someone does break into your home and steal the car keys and take your car, uh, that we will be able to know where that vehicle is through GPS and remotely turn the engine off you know, through the computerised systems and technology that's a reality in terms of its potentiality. It's not there yet, but I, you know, it's not what, like we're talking about you know, space travel 50 years before it happened. This, this is genuinely possible, so I'm hoping through technology and time we'll be able to do a lot in this space. Um, I believe that the current police policy is um, as restrictive as it possibly can be. I would not want to see it any more restrictive than it is. You have to have, in my view, the ability for officers to have you know, situational judgment and discretion in terms of managing these situations. Um, I also think, though, that because we retrained all officers last year and this new policy only came in in December, it's a bit early to talk about either making the policy even more restrictive uh, or relaxing it. I think we need to go with the current policy into the foreseeable future. Commissioner, has the police minister indicated to you whether he wants the policy to be less restrictive? No, all the, as I understand it, all the police minister has said is that he wants to review the current policy and the peripheral, is, peripheral issues that go with the current policy. And I think that's, that's fine. I mean, we're very supportive of that. And as I said, we're preparing um, you know, a ministerial brief uh, for the uh, police minister in relation to the history of the policy, how it is that the policy arrived at the place where it is now, um, and uh, as well as some of those other issues. He has, uh, he has also said that it's his belief that it's too easy to flee from police in Queensland and it's, um, that the policy changes that were made under the past government probably went too far. Yeah. Well, I'm not saying they need to be scaled back as such, but do you agree with those comments? Uh, I, it was my view... Um, that we probably, I, I saw this as evolutionary and I saw it that, that over time the police policy on pursuits would become more restrictive um, and I saw that we would end up where we are now at some stage. It's probably true to say that we got there a little bit sooner than I personally would have liked um, but nonetheless that's where we are now um, and I'm not being critical of anyone uh, in making that observation. Uh, this is one of those areas where probably if you talk to 20 people you might get 20 different views. Um, but um, I, I think that um, uh, there's no problem at all and I welcome the Minister you know, reviewing the matter and, um, and if um, there were to be changes to the policy, well obviously um, as a government department, uh, obviously the government of the day sets policy directions. Um, but I've expressed my view. Uh, which I'm happy to repeat if you want me to, but um, regard we are where we are now, and we've only just got there, you know. Uh, and it's a big thing to retrain an entire police department and a new policy. You mentioned remote engine disablers. Those BMWs, they're quite new cars. Do they not already have those? And was it not possible to do that yesterday? Uh, well, I don't know the answer to that question, but one would have thought that had it been possible, that that action would have been put into place. But certainly you're right. Um, that was <laughs> the point I guess I was trying to make, perhaps not very well. But I'm not talking about something that's um, out in the stratosphere here. The concepts of um, technology with GPS and remote engine disablers um, are possible, quite possible. And again, that can't happen tomorrow, but into the future I'm hopeful that technology will, will be one of the answers to this terribly difficult problem that we do face. Even though this technology does exist in some cars, police can't access it 
yet. They can't use it yet. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, well, well, no, all I'm saying really is that, that in the situation where, and fortunately that happens rarely, but when it does happen it's terrible, where someone steals a car and where the people who do that are totally irresponsible and they engage in a police pursuit and want to continue in that high-risk activity, and they do that intentionally and deliberately, that what will assist us into the future will be technology such as uh, remote engine disablers, so that that stolen car can simply have the motor switched off. But it can't be used at the moment, even though some cars No, I think some cars do have it, and I think that that technology does exist um, in some vehicles, and especially the higher-end price vehicles. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, we wouldn't do it without the owner's consent. What I'm talking about here is stolen cars, OK? Um, I'm talking about stolen cars. I'm not talking about the person who, who owns the vehicle and has run away from the police because they've had too much to drink or they're unlicensed. You know, I'm talking about stolen cars. And that's where I think technology will in the future. But that's into the future. We have to deal with the reality of situations like yesterday and the here and now. And what we have to do with those situations is my people have to make judgment calls based on the circumstances at the time. And I thought yesterday, at the risk of being repetitive here, was an example where I think they did that pretty well. What is actually restrictive about these police pursuit laws? What makes them the most restrictive they've ever been? Uh, I'm happy to give you the example and history of that. But, but as I mentioned, uh, there was a time, about 12 years or so ago, uh, where our policy was very open-ended and basically the police could chase for any offence under any circumstances. If you like afterwards, I'll get you a copy of the current policy, uh, but essentially it has to be a crime, it can't be a minor offence. Uh, it has to be that the benefit of the pursuit uh, outweighs the risks associated with the pursuit, and it also has to be that there is a demonstrable, imminent, immediate need to apprehend the people involved. In other words, it's not better just to let them go and try and catch them later. But can I get you a copy of the policy? Yeah, yeah. OK. Would anyone else, would others like that as well? No? OK. Richard, um, the incident yesterday proved that some of these suspects are really laughing in the face of the justice system. Do you think that's because the sentencings that have been previously handed out haven't been harsh enough? Yeah, it's a really good question. I thank you for asking it. Um, the, I, I, I have said for some time that if you are going to not stop for the police, um, and basically just accelerate away, that there has to be a discouragement for that behaviour. Uh, and for most people, hopefully, um, the new legislation, with the what I understand is going to be the minimum penalty, uh, will help in terms of being a discouragement. And th this is, I guess, I'm talking about here, if there is such a thing. Thank goodness that this happens, really. Most people do stop for the police. It would be a terrible situation if they didn't. But for most of those people, um, the discouragement needs to be there so that they pause and think for a second and think, right, if I do this, um, what they need to know is, is that the penalty is going to be worse than if they stopped. So if they've been drinking um, and they stopped, they might lose their licence for three months and get a $500 fine. Under the regime that's proposed, the minimum penalty will be a $5,000 fine and two years disqualification. I'm very supportive of that because up to date the average penalty for evading the police has been a $250 fine. Now you, if you don't wear a seatbelt it's a $300 fine. So uh, my concern has been is that the deterrent effect has not been there in terms of evading the police. But the issue you raised is separate to that yet again and that's that new phenomena that I mentioned earlier We have people who steal vehicles and actively engage with the police uh, in terms of this high risk taking behaviour. And as I mentioned, generally these people are young, they're male, um, they may be alcohol or drug affected at the time, and their behaviour can be so high risk uh, that they can apparently on the face of it have no concern for them, their, their own safety or the safety of anyone else. And this is a very dis concerning level of behaviour. So your point, as I understood it, um, you know, was what do we do with people like that? Um, and um, uh, that's a very difficult question because uh, it, it would seem as though some just don't care, just don't care. Um, but what we have to do, I think, is at both the front and rear end, we have to try and prevent this sort of behaviour. But again, 
I think there has to be some consequences for it that makes them think twice, especially in terms of repeat behaviour. OK. Anything else at all? Really appreciate your time. Thanks again for your help yesterday. We'll get uh, the copy of the policy, if you could just wait behind. Yeah. Uh,